Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And the weather, it looks, the, the snow is cleared, starting to feel good. I noticed that my native junipers really loaded up with pollen. Now, here's what you, what you can identify a male and a female juniper by this trick. There's male and female of your native alligator bark and shaggy bark junipers. They're both very closely related, but the bark is a little bit different, but they act the same. There's a, there's a girl and a boy, and the females will actually form the berries. They're the ones that really aren't, they're kind of messy because they're always dropping berries, but the males, they're the ones that cause all the allergy issues. They're the ones, they don't form berries, but they're starting to turn yellow right now, this golden hue. I looked out and went, oh my gosh, these things are loaded. Whoa, it's going to be a bad allergy year. That's not good with because allergies and COVID. What's the difference? My head hurts. I'm sneezing. What am I doing? But you, you're not achy. So this is going to be hopefully what we want. If we could have one last real cold snap, just go down to 18 degrees. That'll take out all that pollen, and it'll, it'll be less of a problem for us. But right now, the moisture, the temperature, the, the stars have aligned where the male junipers are just packed with, with pollen. You can hardly see the foliage on them. There's just so much pollen on them. So, so what will happen is in the middle to the end of March, all of a sudden they will just explode. Literally, it looks like the tree is on fire. It's smoky, pollen, golden color coming up, and, and he's wanting to pollinate every gal up and down the mountainside. And that's how junipers work. So if you've got allergy problems, it's not junipers, it's male junipers. It's not some little tiny ground cover thing you get from the garden center. The pollens have been bred out of all of those kinds of, of junipers. It's these big males. They're the ones that cause this issue. And, and entire valleys can be filled with this pollen. And so that's just, just look for it. That's what's going to happen. There's no way to get out of it. But if a frost comes now, between now and the next two, three weeks, I mean, not just frost, a deep freeze, that can really eliminate or reduce the amount of allergies, issues that some people have. For me, for, for my allergies, I take wild honey. I'm telling you, it, it does help. So I go down to uh, the honey man, I get their wild honey. They have a, a wildflower mix and a, a mesquite mix. They kind of change it up. They can kind of give you a lesson with it, but have a teaspoon in my coffee every morning. Just learn how to do that or, or smoothie or whatever your morning routine is. And it really does take the edge off. It helps your body get used to the different kinds of pollens that are naturally occurring. You can't just have any Honey, it's got to be locally sourced if at all possible because the bees are now harvesting the, the pollen from all the different types of plants that we have here. And so it just works for me. Anyway, uh, another thing I noticed, we've got customers coming into the garden center right now. They are they're seeing this strange pattern going through the garden through their gardens. And so what we're seeing is the snow has melted, lifted. Now you'll see these trails of dirt piled up on top of the gardens. So it's almost like it was laid down on top of the garden. And these are vole trails. It's, it's a field mouse. It's a, it's a mouse. It looks like a, a house mouse, only with a more pointy nose. They like to live near compost piles. They love garden areas. And they eat the roots off of your garden plants. Roots off of trees, roots off of perennials, roots off of, they eat roots, that's what they do. They love getting into grass and weeds. And so those are the past trails. And when that snow is on us, it took a couple weeks to melt. And now what they're doing is they were burrowing underneath the snow, between the snow layer and the soil layer. And they were leaving these big mounds or, or tunnel networks. So if you see a strange pattern on, on top of your rock, 
on top of your garden soils, near your compost piles, those are voles or field mice. You've got, you've got yard mice and they eat, eat stuff. They're not good for your gardens. You should deal with them. So I shot a video. I'm going to try to explain how to deal with them here shortly. So that'll post through our Facebook, Twitter, and, and uh, I think Instagram feeds. We've got Instagram, you Instagrammers. We finally figured out how to use Instagram TV. And so, you know, like or follow us on Instagram and you'll be updated on what it looks like, how to deal with it in my own gardens. It was kind of a freakish thing. You don't see this happen very often. And so this unique pattern, if in doubt, take a picture of it, bring it in and go, yep, that's it. Here's a, here, that's a vole. Here's what you do. Uh, I just set some traps and I've got my, I've got a special tool. It's called a gopher probe. It's mainly for my pocket gophers. And then I've, I found where that tunnel is just underneath the surface of the garden soil. And you'll feel it pop in and you go, oh, I'm in the tunnel. And I'll give it a little swig of some uh, zinc-based uh, seed, poison kind of stuff, and it just takes them right out. So you do not want voles roaming around your landscape, getting into your hot tubs, eating eating your gardens. You just They can really cause issues. You really don't want pack rats. That's even worse. That's like a vole on steroids times two. So pack rats and voles are both out right now. It's been warm enough. You're seeing them search for new Homes, mom's kind of, mama's kicked them out of the nest, their winter nest, and now they're on their own to go and get into the neighbor, into uh, the garage, get into the, the built-in grill, get into, they just get into stuff. Kind of watch that one. I am noticing my own gardens just while I was out there, uh, the berries or brambles. So it's a good time to be planting blackberries and raspberries and boysenberries, blueberries. It's a good time to put berries in. I'm seeing that in my own gardens, these are established plants, new buds. They're just about to unfurl. So if we get a couple 60 degree weather days, they're just going to go whoop, start growing, which it looks like it could be a really good berry year. Someone, I was just helping a customer yesterday afternoon, and they were asking, how close do I pack berries together? And so we're seeing a lot of interest in this edible uh, landscapes where I can harvest parts, fruits, vegetables uh, out of my my gardens. So this is a popular thing. Last week's garden class, it was on fruit trees. 60 people are at the class with another 200 watching online. So we stream it through our, we actually have cameras set up. We're trying to get real professional with this. Great, a professional, great audio, good lighting in the greenhouse, but more people are watching it online and still there's a lot of pent-up demand just right here at the garden center so this is one too there is going to be shortages on plants this year they're they're just across the country not just here in prescott but across the country i think we've sourced enough but uh, like we're selling 10 15 fruit trees to one individual well we have two three hundred fruit trees here when will there be shortages when people are buying 10, 15 at a time? It doesn't take very long. So I don't know what the, and it's not like you just go hit a button and go, yeah, make, make 10 more of those. I'll take them. These things, they were planted five years ago. So they take, all of our fruit trees are at least five to seven years old before they even get here. And so most trees have a maturity. They need a, juveniles don't produce fruit. They need to be five to seven years old before they're old enough to start setting fruit, to be a fruiting age, basically. So it's not like you just, it's its minimum five years before we get more of that same size. Now we've got crop rotations, so there's always, there's always more coming, but that's just something to watch. This is one probably don't wait. Grab them when you see them because they won't be here the next day sometimes, depending on the variety and, and tape, shape and size. So apples and pears and cherries and apricots, nectarines, all these grow really well here. Plums, blackberries, raspberries, grapes, those are coming in this week. So all that I predict will run out of basic things like lilacs. We've grown several hundred. There's strong demand for all kinds of plants out there in the yard. Be right back with your garden questions after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. 
Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden Companion Plants in February are Peony, Lily of the Valley, Pinion Pines, and Calgary Carpet Juniper. Calgary Carpet Juniper shows rich green mounds of juniper beauty that grows ankle high for the perfect ground cover. An ideal choice for low water, low care erosion control on natural banks or to soften that rock lawn. The perfect green nestled between boulders or to soften the top edge of a retaining wall. Shop for these juniper beauties in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Save natural, organic, fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener, green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. Yes. And we've got uh, Lisa Watersling in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. Just what's going on with your neighbors? What are they talking about? What do you see from them? And there's something to be learned about mm-hmm. the neighborhoods. When when aphids hit, they hit the entire neighborhood. When, uh, when the magnolias are blooming, they're blooming throughout the neighborhood. And so... We're trying something new out. We've mm-hmm. got, uh, we're trying video and <laughs> audio at the same time. I don't know. So you can see who's actually talking. Yes. It's kind of clunky and awkward, but it's capturing the audio really well. Let's hope. I'm not sure I have feel about people actually seeing <laughs> us <laughs> when we do this. I'm not sure because usually we're making faces at each I other. Yeah. And <laughs> so well, we could be interesting. We're just back from El Paso. Texas yes. was mm-hmm. slammed. With uh, with with weather this week, so we were last President's Day weekend. We thought, let's go visit the grandkids in El Paso. So, uh, eight inches of snow throughout El Paso, (laughs) which they never see. It's going to be a really good year for uh, for garden center owners because all the palm trees are dead. All that borderline stuff did die. Yeah, Uh, Austin, Texas. We got kids in Austin, and they were without power for like. Um, close to two days Mm -hmm. they got the power back on and then no no water water. (laughs) (laughs) i'm sure all the pipes broke within the main municipality um, they're just not set up for that they're not ready for it they didn't predict it so i feel bad for them we took well with the grandkids we actually had fun we went out and played in the snow it was very fortuitous the day before so they found out they're moving to Germany. So we went out and we bought jackets and gloves and all this stuff. And the next day it snowed. So it was perfect timing for yep. them, yeah. not anybody else, but for them. And we didn't go anywhere all weekend. No. Oh, well, we did. Well, and then well, we, went, we out, went to the park. Went to the park, <laughs> which had a huge green space in their neighborhood. Yeah. And all the families were out there. And enjoy- first of all, El Pasoans. Is, is that how you say El Paso? Uh, sure. People yes. live in El, El, El Paso. Yes. Well, this is broadcast from Northern Arizona. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know. There's a lot of people from that have served in the in the yeah. army. That's Fort Bliss. Yeah, I'm sure that do know El Paso or not. Anyway, uh, they didn't go out much, so they were no. they were hunkered down. Uh, we were out there going to Colts. Okay, for for mountain folks, it's yeah. pretty good. It's so funny uh, taking the kids. We're so we're getting dressed. Any mother knows what a process yeah, it I is know. to get these kids dressed to go outside. And so I'm telling you, long pants. First of all, long pants. How about just socks? <laughs> they were going socks. Of course, they had the little ankle socks on. I'm like, guys, you want socks that go up to your knees? And they're looking at me like, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's fun. We had a good time. It was fun. It, it was. Took the dogs out, all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, well, this is about garden questions. What are people talking about? Anything good going on? I mean, anything, well, there's uh, always good stuff going on. So our first question is from Jack out in Chino. This year, he says he wants great apples. He's tired of the wormy apples. So he wants yeah. to know how to get rid of the worms. And his other question is, is what time 
do you thin the fruit? How long do sure. you wait before Good you thin? Questions. Yeah, those are great questions. So, so apples and pears, this, this advice goes for both of those. They can get coddling moth. Coddling moth is a little tiny, it's a worm that it gets in the fruit and it eats the fruit and where they, when they, it's a little tiny moth, well, maybe a quarter inch, third of an small. inch. It's very small. Mm -hmm. And they attack a tree or they lay eggs on a tree by the thousands. And so she'll initially lay her eggs from that fruit when it's in bloom, as the fruit is being pollinated, as the bees are pollinating, she's laying her egg inside that fruit. And then the fruit actually seals over that fruit. And that's where you see a fruit, an apple or a pear with one exit tunnel. It was, she laid her egg, it matured and then burrowed its way out or ate its way out and then flew around and laid more eggs. <laughs> Sometimes it gets so bad because we've got such a long growing season that you'll, she'll lay the egg on the outside of the pear or the apple. It'll burrow in, nurture itself on the inside and then burrow back out. That's when you see multiple exit and enter, entrance tunnels. They're all caused by the same thing, coddling moth. Now, what do you do? Well, what you do is you need to kill the coddling moth. Don't let them get in there. And it's really easy. Uh, they make a, we have a spray that takes them out called BT mm -hmm. uh, through census. How do you say that again? Bexilius thuricide. You're so good with those big words. Thank That's you. what I love about you. <laughs> one of the many things. Yeah. So one of, anyway, it's not the reason I fell in love with you, but uh, I love you more because of it. Help poor Jack out here. He wants to get rid of his worms. <laughs> anyway, um, if you can, the, she lays her eggs when the, when the petals are just starting to drop. When the tree's been in bloom for a while, the petals are dropping. It almost looks like it's snowing. If you can spray it right then, you'll get rid of that first generation where you only get one exit tunnel coming out mm -hmm. of a fruit. Now, the problem is we're so mild here in the mountains of Arizona that you'll have two more uh, uh, attaching or egg layings or whatever you call that from coddling moth. And so you need to know when to spray again. When are they active? Because if you spray too far, too soon or too late, it's not effective. So now we have what's called a coddling moth trap. We sell them here at the garden center and you want to hang a trap in the tree one per tree kind of thing, come in a set of three or whatever, mm -hmm. um, lay it out there and, and hang it in the tree. You'll go out and monitor it weekly, daily, something like that. You go, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. No moths are inside this. It's got a pheromone that attracts them. So when they start to go after this tree, you'll see them show mm -hmm. up. You'll go out one day, three weeks later and go, oh, there's a moth in there. Where'd that come from? I didn't see that before. The next night you'll go, oh, there's like three or four more. And then like five day five into this, there's like, it's filled You're going, Oh, they are actively laying eggs on my fruit. It's time to spray, okay. spray it with the same thing. Totally organic takes out the coddling moth. If you're diligent about that, if you can catch it while they're actively laying eggs, you will obliterate all the larva, the worms, mm -hmm. and you'll have clean, beautiful fruit. Now going back to, uh, when do I thin the fruit? Mm -hmm. So apples, most, most, you'll need to thin off probably about half, at least a third to half the fruit. Otherwise you'll end up with lots of little tiny fruits and all seed, no fruit. Um, you need to take some of that, some of that fruit off so that all the energy coming up from the roots goes up through the trunk and then into the remaining fruits. So when to do that? Usually apples come in clusters of four or five apples. Mm -hmm. You probably want no more than two per cluster. Okay. Wait till they're large enough to spot and then pick off the two, three weakest ones, leave the strongest ones. Uh, that's the secret. So when they're big enough to identify their apples, maybe they're size of a dime, mm -hmm. no more than a quarter. Okay. It's time. Just, just pick them off. You should be like Edward Scissorhand, just pick them all <laughs> off and throw them out there. And, and now all remaining fruit will go into those remaining Apples or pears. They're okay. both the same way. I'd say the same thing. Plums, apricots, peaches. You need to thin those as well. Sure. There you go. Jack, you better fruit. you're now an expert on how to deal with coddling moth and have larger fruits. There you go. And if you have questions, just let us know. Yeah, we, yes. we, we do this all the time. So <laughs> yeah. this is what we do at the garden center. Come visit right. us. Mm -hmm. Google, if you research that, you will be so dumbfounded by it. You uh, won't know what to too do. Too much information. Come talk to, to a local. We'll, we'll help you out with that. Right. All right. Do we have time for more questions? I think we do. Go for it. All right. Well, this is from Emma in Prescott. She's redoing her backyard to put more edibles in. Yep. 
And so she wants to know how much space do you leave for raspberries oh, and raspberries sure. and blackberries and blueberries, that type of thing. And then her other question is what kind of sun exposure do they need? Full sun, morning sun? What's the best way to position them? All fruits, brambles, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, boysenberries. They all need six hours or more of sun. Otherwise, you just aren't going to get that much fruit. So okay. it needs more sun, the better. Full sun, mm -hmm. it's even better. So that's how much sun. Spacing, like we've got lots of grapes, blackberries, raspberries in our backyard, mm -hmm. and about eight foot. If you okay. if you put them in a little bit tighter, let's mm -hmm. say four to six feet, you'll have this solid row of just fruits. Mm -hmm. Be great. We're using them to soften up mm -hmm. that the fence lines. So it doesn't look so prison -esque. Fence like Yeah, yeah. Well, fence like <laughs> more garden -esque, secret garden. Right. And so we place them at eight. Every panel has got a something planted down the row of the mm -hmm. fence. And that seems to work out really well. I'd say it's a little bit, if you want a lot of fruit, space them in a little, kind of go a little bit tighter, maybe oh, okay. four to six feet and you'll have better advice, better, mm -hmm. better fruit, better plants. All right. That's it for this segment of the show. Ken and Lisa Lane and oops, time's up. The <laughs> Thousand Gardeners. <laughs> You've been notified. We're off the air. Be right back after this. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. It's almost spring. Time to grow a pear. A pear tree, that is. Late winter is ideal for planting fruit trees. At Waters Garden Center has cherry-picked the hardiest, heaviest producing trees from our most trusted growers. From apples to apricots and persimmons to pears, the garden center is plumb full of varieties that thrive in our mountain soil. And we'll even plant them for you. We believe life is a bowl of cherries, so grow the best ones ever. From Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden Companions of February are Peony, Calgary Carpet Juniper, Pinion Pines, and Lily of the Valley. Lily of the Valley is a gorgeous shrub that loves growing in the summer shade. This bold evergreen delights with dramatic, fiery growth in spring. Fragrant wedding cake layers of white flowers hover on graceful arching stems. Each dainty flower is utterly detestable to deer and javelina. Shop the most perennial shrubs in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. The weather is so nice that everything is going to start taking off here in the next few days. I mean, literally, it's happening right now before our eyes. And so as you walk through the garden, you're going to see your hyacinth bulbs, your daffodils, tulips coming up out of the ground. You're going to see new leaves, new, new buds and growth on your roses, on your, on your trees, shrubs. Things are going to wake up very, very quickly. So should you be worried so I had helped a customer earlier this week, said, oh, my bulbs are starting to show up. I'm, I'm seeing them emerge from the ground. I, I know we're not done with cold. What happens if it snows again? What do I do? Don't, don't worry. They are mountain plants. They like the spring. They know what our season brings. They know that it will be cold. They know there'll be frost. They know. And so don't worry about it. Encourage them. What will happen is as they're warm, they'll start to elongate and grow really fast. And then as it, as it gets cold, as we get frost, it will actually, they'll slow down. They'll stop growing. And so they'll just go with the flow. They'll, they'll take whatever weather, and then they'll be in bloom. Usually, uh, in March, you're going to see another two, three weeks, you'll see things starting to bloom. So your flowering quince will start to take off. They're okay with cold. They're used to that. Now, that's not the way it is with summer plants. Now, summer plants like crepe myrtles and rose of Sharon's, your, your tomatoes, they're all going to wait. They don't like the cold. They like summer. They're summer plants. And so if you're gardening now, it's good. You can do that. Make sure you're putting spring plants out. They like this kind of weather. It's a great time to be putting in your deciduous plants, things that lose their foliage. This would be your lilacs and forsythias and quince and all those early spring bloomers. 
It's a good time. We just got a, a new shipment of you know hundreds of roses in. They're still dormant. They haven't leafed out. They're not in flower, but you can get they're fully rooted, and you put them in the ground now, and then they will wake up as the season when all the other roses wake up, when all the other lilacs wake up, when all the other there's some new um, pansies came in kale. Uh, calendulas, snapdragons. These are all early spring plants. They're here at the garden center. They're in full bloom. You can put them right out in the gardens, a new container, whatever you decide, and they're good. They're okay with that. And so if it snows, fun. They're, they're going, they like it. They actually, they bloom longer. The colder it gets, the more they bloom. They're crazy. So I love pansies. Uh, one, we, we got a new shipment of tomatoes. And now, we brought tomatoes in. These are one-gallon sizes. They're already up a foot and a half tall. I'm surprised they don't have fruit on them. We brought them in for the folks that want to have a tomato started in their greenhouse, Arizona room. A lot of folks have the time. They'll put them in a container, and they put them out in the sun during the day, and they roll them in the garage at night. So it's for those few folks that want to start early. We have some tomatoes. I think it's early girls and romas, your basic tomatoes. We'll have, I, I maybe have a few dozen tomatoes right now. I'll have a few thousand tomatoes starting mid to end of April. This is when this is when you put them in the ground. It's like everyone is starting to garden at that point. So we're still a month and a half away from when that really, the summer gardens go in. Locally, what the local gardens use, Mother's Day is our demarcation line that's our that's our shift between spring and summer that's typically our last frost date typically now i've seen it snow on labor day weekend mother's day weekend you just the mountains can be freaky but on average may 8th is our 100 years of data we've been tracking this may 8th seems to be our last frost date on average now some years it's not it's the end of april some years it's in the middle of may so but the average it's May 8th. And so that's why Mother's Day is our demarcation line. That's when you start putting in your summer plants. You would not want to wait to put in your lettuce, your spinach, your, your grapes, your blackberries, raspberries, fruit trees. Until then, you really, they need to be going in the ground before. They're spring plants. They would much prefer being planted now through May 8th. If you wait, they'll be fully leafed. They might be in blossom. They might even be setting some new fruits, let's say peaches and apricots. You can do it then, but it's riskier. It's harder. You have to be more of a gardener. You have to be more exact at that point. And so you got to be right on the money with your irrigation. Whereas now, if you're planting them now, way more forgiveness with things. So you can fudge it around and, and you can almost blunder your way into success because you're working with the seasons, with the environment instead of against it. So if you can get things in the ground before they have leafed out, there's less transplant shock, less, less issues. So not that you can't do it. We sell fruit trees 12 months out of the year. It's just every, you've got the best selection right now because it's the best time of year to put them, best time of the seasons to put them in the ground. And so you're, you're working with the flow of the inventory, the plant harvests at your garden centers by doing it now. I mean, the secret to gardening if you've struggled in the past, if you could just figure out when to garden certain things. So when do tomatoes go in? When should I plant lettuce? When should I put geraniums in? When should a new hedgerow? When should I put windscreens? When should, if you can work with the environment, there is peak windows to do certain things. The best time to put evergreens in? This is a great time to come into the garden center and see the evergreens because you can see what they look like at the end of winter just before they flush their new growth. It's a great time to, to, to put them in and see what they are. It's a great time to plant them. Okay, we got more. Lisa Waters Lane coming in with her garden segment right after this. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Waters Garden Companion Plants of February are Calgary Carpet Juniper, Lily of the Valley, Pinion Pines, and Peony. Your grandmother would fall in love with these larger peony with so many colors to choose from. 
There's nothing like the enormous flowers to add stunning pops of color. Endearing springtime blooms are more than fragrant with luscious double flowers. Shop the most perennial peonies in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Save natural, organic, fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. All right, we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio, Mm -hmm. my favorite gal. I just love being in little rooms with you. <laughs> but not too little. I don't not mind. I little. could get under blankets. <laughs> That's too much for the airwaves. Anyway, <laughs> my, my favorite yell in all the world, we've been married for 33 years. Is mm-hmm. that right? 32? 32, 33 Going coming on up. 33. Here in a couple months. Yeah, a few months. Is that right? No. Uh, yeah. Is it? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> No, that's not. We're under pressure here. We got a <laughs> clock going, and people are listening in. Let's let's move on. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ken Lisa Lane. We're just, this is her segment. She comes and shares just what have you been seeing in the gardens? What have you been talking about with mm-hmm. other gardeners? And so that's what she comes to share. So, welcome back into the studio. Well, thank you very much. So we got in our roses. So. We got what about two hundred or know. so like tables roses and in. And now on. this isn't our shipment that we get where they're already growing and blooming. This is our early shipment, so they're still dormant. They're a dormant rose, and they're planted into a fiber pot. But the great thing about them is they're well rooted yeah. out. So you're going to take that fiber pot. You can either pull them out of the fiber pot and plant them, or you rough up the fiber pot, take the bottom off and you just plant that. But the nice thing about it is it's well rooted, which is so different from bare root roses. Yeah. We should explain that. What's the difference between a bare root? Go ahead, dear. You're the mountain gardener. (laughs) Explain it to (laughs) us. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, No pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, uh, bare root is they're grown in 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 a farm in a row setting. And so they'll be three, four, five years old, and then they'll go harvest them, pull them out of the ground, shave off the roots, take all the, the soil off and shave them, put them in a bag, uh, and, and then usually put some, sawdust. some some sawdust or peat moss or something in there to keep them moist. And so they're literally bare. There's not, there's no soil, no nothing. Mm-hmm. When you plant this, it is just a stick, stick in the ground. We used to sell thousands of these back in the day. The problem in a dry climate, the mountains of Arizona, Arizona, period, <laughs> is that it's so dry. Mm-hmm. And so the canes would dry out, and would, would put off their new buds. The roots would dry out, wouldn't put off new roots. And so the death rate was about half. This is if you're a really good gardener, half of the plants would die. I'm going, that does not fit a waters. People come here shopping at Waters Garden mm-hmm. Center specifically or your independent garden center so that plants really they grow. Right. You're guaranteed to grow. My success goes <clears throat> up. And so we feel the pressure that way. Yeah. Said, so, okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to take our bare root from last year, put them in a fiber pot, put them in actual soil and root them out and then bring them in the next year. So these are already a year older. And now we've got a fully rooted plant that's already budded. So you put this thing in the ground, the roots go right through the fiber pot and it mm-hmm. is it just, it just goes. Now we have a 99 point whatever percent success. It's off the charts. Yeah. Going, now this fits our model. Our, this mm-hmm. is why people are coming to shop at Waters Garden Center. Right. From there, you go from fiber pots, which you get now is the latest, greatest varieties. The ones that are hard to find, you'll, sh- you'll see them early on. Mm-hmm. We'll have another thousand roses show up the last week of April. Wh- whenever the last frost we think the last frost is. So we're growing these in, in three, 
four and five gallon pots. Mm -hmm. These fully not fiber pots, actual plastic, plastic growers pots. They'll show up usually the last week of April and they will all be in complete bloom. It's mm -hmm. kind of fun. And we've got so many of them. We just spill out in the parking lot. So you have to wade through roses to get to the actual garden center. It's just so exciting. So Mr. Garden Guy, okay. why, why should they buy a dormant rose right now in a fiber pot as opposed to waiting until end of April and May, other than, yeah, different varieties. What's so, the benefit? So they're a little bit better, a little lower priced. So mm -hmm. you, you save a couple bucks. That's good. More than a couple bucks. Yeah. You get better choice, better selection. Also, it's February, March. The gardeners aren't out yet, or only the true gardeners are out yet. Mm -hmm. And so you're dealing with more choice with less competition. Mm -hmm. So literally in the spring, in gardeners, non-gardeners, everyone is out gardening. And so you, you've got a lot more choices, but there's a lot more competition. So you, you'll be gone. That fragrant cloud that you've been wanting for, for two years. I mean, we've got 10 of them now and there'll be none at the end of the day. So you mm -hmm. got to, there's, there's pressure. Mm -hmm. Now you can peruse and look at them a little bit better. It's mm -hmm. less, less chaos. Is, is there an advantage? So we always tell people, so your fruit tree is dormant, take it home and plant it, wakes up in its new home and yeah. it's happy and good to go. Is that the same true with these, these dormant roses? So they are going to wake up when all the other roses wake up here in the mountains of Arizona. So there is some benefit to that. So mm -hmm. there's virtually no transplant shock. Right. That is true. Whereas in April, they've got all this tender new growth. They're all budded. They've all got flowers. And so you are going to find, you got to be... On your more game accurate. A bit more, Gotta yeah. be on your game. Yeah. Otherwise they can actually stress out and have, mm -hmm. an, issue, have an issue. So yeah, less transplant shock. Okay. Well, I can show you how to get out of that. Oh, sure. Either, either way. I'm just trying to help, help people understand why they want to run down today and go buy the roses. So what are some great <laughs> roses that maybe they'll only find here at Waters Garden Oh, Center? you bet. So we, we've got the assortment. So we have some Floribundas, um, some tea roses, some Grandifloras, kind of an assortment of, of, you know, different varieties, uh, different colors. So I went through the list because it was a big list and yeah. I went, oh, which, which ones are my favorite? So that's what I looked for. Um, the first one that I saw was the Belinda Blush. So I'm kind of, I like the lighter color roses. That's where I tend to lend to. I like the name Belinda. Oh, okay. Did you date a Belinda? <laughs> no. like, okay, just checking. Just a Belisa. <laughs> Okay. That's terrible. So Belinda is a uh, a cream flower with a pink around the edge of it. Very, very pretty, but it is actually a shrub rose. Yeah. So shrub roses are different from tea roses. How? Well, they're not grafted, so they're on their original rootstock. So it's way easier, way more forgiving. Mm -hmm. Usually, this is the old days, shrub roses would have a smaller flower to it, but anymore, they're they're so they've bred them, so they're just Nice you could big. hardly tell the difference. Right, right. Hybrid teas are long stem roses. That's what mm -hmm. you get for Valentine's. Right. And then Floribundas are long stem roses with a cluster of flowers, large flower and multiple flowers. So right. you get kind of all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that I really love, and people ask for this one all the time, and it goes out quick, is the Blue Girl, yes. which is not really blue. It's more of a lavender, silvery lavender. I don't think there's a true blue, like this color blue. As out a man, there. it's pretty close to blue. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. <laughs> but the fragrance on it uh, is amazing. So that's a hybrid tea. So uh, double delight. Now that is a rose that's been around for eons and eons, but it's hard to find. Yeah. And it's so popular that when you do get it in, it is gone. It's gone, yeah. So we did bring in some extra double delights. So if you've been hunting those down. Would that be a triple delight or just a double delight or extra double delight? Uh, <laughs> um, so we got one called Smoking Bean or no. Yeah, coffee bean. I had to go, what's coffee bean? Because like, I didn't know what it was. I think that's one of the newer ones. And it's actually a miniature rose. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a miniature rose, but the blossom on it is kind of a real smoky, orangey red color. Very, very pretty. So that was a new one I had to look up. So I thought I'd talk about that one. Um, one of my favorite smelling roses, my favorite smelling rose, is the Sugar Moon. So Sugar Moon is a white rose, but the fragrance, oh my gosh, put it near a window that you open all the time because it is so fragrant. Um, 
got a lot of some of the old standards, um, you know, Chrysler Imperial, Classic. Veterans Honors, um, just a lot of the old timies that just are proven great roses. Um, but a lot of new ones too. I didn't write because I didn't have time to write down. It's just dozens all and dozens of the names it's a good time on to, them. To pick a rose and to plant a rose. Oh, definitely, definitely. So, I mean, if you like oranges. I think we probably have four or five different oranges. You want reds? We probably got six to eight different reds. You know, we ran out of last year was Mr. Lincoln. Old oh, fashioned rose. Yeah. Did we get some of those in? We did. Others? Oh, good. We actually got There's extra. We got extra Mr. Lincoln's in because you're right. They are so popular. Old fashioned, classic, hearty, mm -hmm. good rose for here. Truly, and truly is. Well, we are out of time. Thanks for spending another segment with me. Sure. Always a good thing. And Elisa <laughs> Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. That means. We'll be right back after this. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. It's almost spring. Time to grow a pear. A pear tree, that is. Late winter is ideal for planting fruit trees. At Waters Garden Center has cherry-picked the hardiest, heaviest producing trees from our most trusted growers. From apples to apricots and persimmons to pears, the garden center is plum full of varieties that thrive in our mountain soil. And we'll even plant them for you. We believe life is a bowl of cherries, so grow the best ones ever from Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden companion plants of February are peony, Calgary carpet juniper, lily of the valley, and pinion pines. Pinion pine have thick evergreen needles providing year-round beauty and summer shade. It's a local native that blend equally well in a modern or Mediterranean style landscape. Go ahead, enjoy the buttery rich pine nuts from your own backyard. You'll have plenty of nuts and pine, our deer and javelina proof. Shop the most trees in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. As spring begins to wake up. So you're going to see everything starting to go active right now. Uh, every, all your plants wake up, but so do the vermin. So do the insects. Everything wakes up and they've been starving. They've been hibernating. They've been, they are ready. They're very active. So some things to watch for. I'd mentioned voles uh, at the bottom of the hour. Well, gophers, pocket gophers. Now you folks from the East coast, you're thinking moles, there's a different kind of critter that lives in the ground up there in the East Coast, Midwest. Here it is a pocket gopher. If there's mounds of dirt in your yard, that's going to be one thing, pocket gophers. Now, if you're up towards Williams, uh, the next elevation up there, you can see prairie dogs. A little bit bigger critter, pops up out of larger holes. Uh, you rarely do you see a badger. They're usually nocturnal. They come out at night, but they're great big holes. They're not as much of a problem for gardeners, but... Prairie dogs, ground squirrels, so gray squirrel has a hole underneath the rocks typically. Uh, porcupines will be out here very shortly. They'll come out at night and they'll strip the bark off of the lower layer of your, of your trees. Uh, the number one vermin are, well, I guess there's two, pack rats, pocket gophers. Now, if you do your homework, you're doing the internet thing, you'll be overwhelmed with suggestions, wives' tales, I mean, just all kinds of crazy advices out there. Pocket gophers are one of my expertise. I'm very good at it. I've taken them off of 10 acres before, out of orchards, greenhouses. There's nothing worse than having a beautiful new hoop house, growing your crops, and then gophers come underneath. You, if you put rock down, it's perfect. They come up and start destroying, moving everything around. And when that is, that's an insult. And you, you're not going to insult me in my gardens or anywhere else because I'm coming after you. And so you try to get rid of them. And so I've been pretty successful at that. Um, it's pretty brutal. I mean, if you've got a, a if you kind of get queasy with the uh, dead things, probably time to change the channel or turn off the, for just a moment. 
and then we'll be back at you. But really, you need to. These are underground rats. You need to get rid of them. So we do have a not a bait. It's a it's a repellent. It's made from mainly castor bean oil. It's called Mole Max. Although we don't have moles here, they're more East Coast, but it also works on pocket gophers. Mole Max. You you spread it out there, and water it in. And as it goes to the soil, they get this coating on their fur and they just don't like it and so they move around they move out of that area now it's it's effective but not for very long it'll work for about six months it says nine months to a year i'm telling you that does not work that way it doesn't work as long as the as well as the directions say but it does work and so if you want to go organic that's a good way to go safe for your pets safe for birds after that, that's the only real thing that works that's not death and decay kind of stuff. Uh, the, the, they have whirly gigs and kind of solar-powered noise makers. Uh, you know, I've stopped selling all those things. They just don't work. Half of them come back on this thing didn't work. Give me my money back. Don't waste, don't bother your energy time with those. Uh, they just don't work. You really come down to three things that work on pocket gophers uh, you've got bait you've got traps or smoke or kind of kind of a fl road flare basically and so the let's start with the flares uh gopher gassers is what their name we've got them here at the garden center um, they can be effective if you jump on it right away if you have a new mound in a garden and it the tunnel network isn't extensive it is effective, but basically it, it suffocates them. They asphyxiate in, in the hole. So you open up the hole, throw it down there, backfill it, throw a rock on it or a board or something, and it fills up that entire area with smoke. They gag and keel over. You never see a dead body around. It just they go basically back in their nest and go, oh, I can't breathe and fall over. Um, is effective. Not very effective if you've got a lot of mounds. Don't even waste your energy, your time, or your money. It just is not worth it. Because the networks are so large that you, there's no way to fill up the entire tunnel network with smoke. And so it's just find personal experience. doesn't work. Then you go to traps. This is what your grandparents use. You've got your regular green trap. you got to open it up. Generally, you're going to have two traps. Uh, hopefully, you get down to the main tunnel. But then which way are they going to be running up and down that tunnel? And so you need two of them, one to go this way, one to go that way. And then they enter in the trap. It kind of pierces them in the heart and they die. You're going to have to deal with a dead thing in a trap afterwards. And they don't always die right away. So I tell folks, you know, pin it down with a piece of wire so they can't drag it back underneath the ground and, and die further back in the tunnel. And you've just lost a, you know, $5, $10 trap, whatever. So it's going to take two, one in each direction. Pin them down. You don't usually use cheese or apples or anything. It's just they're in the run naturally going back and forth, and they're going to hit it. Uh, it's got a little trap door. They hit the door and kind of gets them. Um, kind of brutal. I used to have up to 12 traps going. I would set them before I came to work, uh, and then I would set them again. I would check the traps. but I'd hit about 50% of the time, so I'd have six gophers I have to deal with every every evening and i'd reset them the next evening so i have another six in the morning i did that for like a month had caught hundreds of gophers i finally went this is just ridiculous i had one fence line from the barn to the house it's maybe a hundred yards something like that maybe a little bit longer and i caught over 50 gophers by trap off that off this line so you don't have one you have entire families so it's something you're going to have to do. It's a process you're doing over a long period of time. And then it's once you get a halo effect or you get them fought back to a certain timeline, uh, space in the in the gardens, well, then you can go, well, it's, it's easier. You can take the pressure is off. What I finally ended up doing was using bait. And I, I used a tool. They call it gopher probe. It's a little T-handled probe with a trap door at the bottom. So you'll poke around the outer edge of that mound and you'll feel this, this probe kind of slip. You go, oh, I'm just, it's got real hard, real hard, real hard. And all of a sudden it slips. You're going, oh, I'm in the tunnel. Now give it a good swig. Uh, it's got a cock handle at the top, releases some, some bait, some basically zinc based seed uh, that uh, gets underneath the ground. It's not exposed to birds or 
other animals or kids or anything else. It's in the tunnel, which just makes it much safer. And then they come in and go, whoa, <laughs> free meal. This is great. They eat it. And what happens is they get sick to their stomach and they go to bed and they don't wake up. So you'll never, again, you, I've never seen a carcass any place. If you're going to use bait, it is critical. I mean, this is super important. You still see strychnine-based baits out there, super dangerous. You don't want to touch it. You don't want to breathe any of the dust. It, it keeps killing is what happens. So it's very effective. But if a coyote or, or bobcat or, or dog or something comes in and eats that dead gopher, dead pack rat or whatever it is, then it keeps killing. It goes right down the food chain. It keeps on killing right just, it's super dangerous. You really want to use a zinc-based uh, poison. Zinc, a little bit of zinc is good for you. A lot isn't, but there's no secondary kill. So once they digest it, it vaporizes or gases off and there's no second kill. So if your cat eats that gopher or eats a mouse or something, it's not going to kill the cat. This is super important. A bird of prey coming down and, and eating a, a gopher that has just ate, eaten some of this, hasn't quite died yet. If, you, if it has strychnine, it'll kill the falcon, the hawk, whatever it is. It's super, really, really, really dangerous. So I can't emphasize that enough. We do not sell anything strychnine-based here at Waters Garden Center. It's just something I believe in. I just I just feel strongly about that. And so, but you'll see it on shelves. Just just do your homework, or if in doubt, shoot me an email or drop in. We'll give you a quick lesson on how to deal with gophers, voles, pack rats, whatever your your issues are. Right now, you'll see uh, porcupines. They're going to come out and strip the bark off of aspens and maples and elms, fruit trees. They love the taste. They sit down at night around the ground and just kind of peel the bark off of your tree, eat it, and then finally the, the tree gets girdled and it dies. So it'll, it'll flush out with new growth this spring and then it'll just collapse the end of May, first part of June. So just some things to watch for. If you see something, take a picture of it, bring it in, we can help guide you through it. But this is when everything wakes up right now, the beginning of spring. Good time to plant for that reason, but it's also a good time to, to watch out for things in the garden. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Not everyone can grow wildflowers, but we'll make sure you're not one of them. At Waters, we know which wildflowers sprout, thrive, and bloom with success. We're wild about wildflowers with many of our own Arizona blends. Like our Arizona native mix, butterfly and hummingbird mixes, and all are big, bold, and beautiful. At Waters, we know wildflowers, and winter's a season to spread new seed. Waters Garden Center, where people who love their flowers wild, they love to shop for seed. Gardening and you don't know where to start? Waters In-Home Garden Service comes to you and identifies what you have and how to make it better. Design advice, water strategies, vegetable and flower gardens, soil and food needs, and problem solving. Always problem solving. You'll instantly be a better gardener. All for just $200 of expert time with a coupon to fill your garden dreams without ever leaving home. In-Home Garden Consultations from Waters Garden Center. We can be at your home this week. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. Already, the evergreens that bloom early are already starting to bloom. So blooming camellias, they're in full bloom right now at the garden center. Full bloom, it's a beautiful hip high evergreen glossy leafed shrub that has this beautiful camellia type flower it's about the size of a baseball something like that beautiful the uh, winter blooming keith heaths and heathers they're in full bloom the white ones and the pink and red ones so in full bloom it's a good time to plant them so you're seeing that leading edge those early early spring plants are showing that they're ready to go so they, they had some moisture now it's warm. If we get a, a few days of 60 degrees, it'll really take off fast. 
So it's a good time to put those things in the ground. In fact, we've got a, a garden class. In fact, this week, uh, today's, this weekend's garden class is gardening for newcomers. Tune in. You can, you can watch at 9.30 through our YouTube channel, through our Facebook page, or Twitter feed. We're trying to make it super accessible. It's free. Just just watch, tune in. And then uh, they'll, they'll save those and upload them later so you can watch them at your convenience. But they're recorded. They're actually taught live and then streamed live Saturdays at 9.30. We'd love to see it at the Garden Center. I mean, that's the best way because now you're interacting. You can feel the energy of the Garden Center. We hold it in the back greenhouse. It's a huge greenhouse, social distanced. It's, it's safe. Uh, we, we're really trying to watch this whole COVID kind of stuff. Uh, so we're trying to make it safe. Tune in, watch, whatever. So gardening for newcomers, we go over uh, frost dates and zones. And what can be guard? When do you garden which? It's very, very uh, uh, content rich. The big thing we'll be pushing this weekend is um, it's time to fertilize everything. How to fertilize? What to fertilize? It's time to feed your plants out in the landscape. Because they're going to wake up hungry. And so we'll push that 744 all-purpose food. So anyway, we'll go over that deep. There will be a handout on that. Please join us. Next Saturday, it's very exciting. We have the evergreens that bloom early. We're going over those evergreen plants uh, that are in the landscape that, that are going to show off here, that are showing off now or will show off very quickly, whether it's a perennial shrubs or trees. What are there? There's a few select that are just rock stars this time of year, and we'll go over all those details. It'll be very hands-on uh, kind of plant, lots of show and tell kind of stuff. Then you've got the spring to-do list. That's the first week in March. That's March 6th. That's gonna be basically a checklist. Uh, how do you weed? How do you fertilize? When, when do you start planting? Just what are, the, what are the things you need to do to get your landscape ready, your irrigation ready when do, for spring? It's very, again, technical. The one I'm most excited about, 59 years ago, the second week in March, 59 years ago, 1962, Harold Waters, my father-in-law, started Waters Garden Center. So every year at that weekend, we have we host a spring open house. So it's a 59th spring open house, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, a lot going on. There'll be classes. We bring in our, our, our growers. They show off the new plants. So we're trying to gear up right now for that March 12th start. Uh, yes, you, we've got plants now, but we'll have way more then because we're kind of launching. We just want to feature. Uh, no matter what, it could be a snowstorm or it could be beautiful weather. We are going to have our spring open house. We've got enough greenhouse space. We could really pull this off easily. So take a look at that. Uh, lots going on. If you start to see things or just feel too pent up, you want to kind of peruse some gardens and take a look and see what's here, please consider this a personal invite to come down to Waters Garden Center. Visit your garden center in your town. Or if it's late at night, you just want to see what, what showed up this week at the garden center, take a look at top10plants.com. We're putting all of our trees and shrubs and not so much the flowers, but all the bigger plants, they're shown at top10plants.com. See price descriptions. It's meant to be there for you as a resource, as a gardener from Waters Garden Center. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is well pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and orderless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Waters Garden Companion Plants of February are Peony, Calgary Carpet Juniper, Lily of the Valley, and Pinion Pines. Pinion Pine have thick evergreen needles providing year-round beauty and summer shade. It's a local native that blend equally well in a modern or Mediterranean-style landscape. Go ahead, enjoy the buttery-rich pine nuts from your own backyard. You'll have plenty of nuts, and pine, our deer, and javelina proof. Shop the most trees in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. 
If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.